talking about what it means to be an authentic church. Authenticity is the goal. We want to be real. We want to be genuine. And we are living in a world of fake news, green screens, and Photoshop. We've trained ourselves, if any of you are on social media, I know some of you aren't, but we've trained ourselves to compare our mess with the highlight reel of other people's lives. The only thing that we see on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter are the good things that happen in people's lives, not necessarily the bad things, the mess, the brokenness, and the hurt. And so we trick ourselves into thinking that all of those good moments that people share is what life is all about, when in reality, life is much more messy than that. My wife, Angel, after she had our son, Knox, a few months ago, got into the, to the TV show, This Is Us. There is a TV show out there, and holy smokes. Let me just give you fellas a word of warning. Do not let your wife watch This Is Us after a highly emotional experience having your son there. I mean, I'm coming in, there's snot rolling down her face, her eyes are puffy because she's crying, and I'm like, honey, what's going on? She's like, it's this TV show, this show, it's just so sad. I'm like, Angel, you do realize that they're acting, all right? They, they have a mask that they have on. They're not, this isn't real. This is something that, that they're pretending to be true. And she goes, yeah, but it happens in real life, and it's just so sad. And it's true. I mean, it does happen in real life, and those things are really sad when you lose people that you love. One of the things that people are saying about this show is that it really does hit home because it reflects what truly does go on in a person's life, and life is really messy. And the same is true in the church. Sometimes we look at church and we think it's just a place for perfect people, and that is not it at all. I am not perfect, and you are not perfect. We are imperfect people doing life together. And so we want to strive to be authentic. And I think one of the problems that people face is that we do, in a sense, put a mask on. Especially, I think, when we come to church, we pass somebody in the hallway, we say hi, and we, we smile, and we say, how are you, and we say good, and it's that same just ritual that we get into. But we all know that our lives are messy, and we all know that we have good times and we have bad times. And so we need to remove our mask as an authentic church. We need to remove the pretending that we have in life and just be real. It's okay to be broken. It's okay to be hurt. It's okay to be happy and have things that, that go well, but we want to be authentic as a church. And I think one of the reasons why people value authenticity is because they despise hypocrisy. And so this morning we're going to kick things off with talking about what it means to be a hypocrite. And if this is your first or second time here and you haven't been in church for a long time, isn't that one of the reasons why you haven't gone to church or maybe you've just started to get back into things, and one of the reasons why you haven't gone to church in a while is because you just don't like people who live hypocritical lives. And I think that's true. And hypocrisy has been around for a long time. Hypocrisy existed back in the day of Jesus. Hypocrisy exists today, and we have hypocrites, I think, all around us, including these very same pews. In fact, at times, I feel like I live a hypocritical life, but I don't want to be. And I think that you'll hear me for any period of time, you will hear me saying how much I make mistakes up on this stage, because if you put me on a pedestal, it hurts when I fall off it. Doesn't it? Doesn't it hurt when you make a mistake? Doesn't it hurt when you fall off that pedestal? And so we can't elevate people higher than what they are, while at the same time, we have to strive to be authentic people and not hypocrites. I think a hypocrite is a person who performs under a mask. They are pretenders. They act as if they are on a stage. That's what it meant to be a hypocrite. And it comes from a literature term uh, in the ancient Greeks. That's what they would call somebody who was an actor. They would call him a hypocrite. Hypocrites are two-faced. Their profession does not match their practice. They say one thing and they do another. And so we could actually probably say a hypocrite is the opposite of authenticity. Hypocrites also have ill motives more often than not. It's one thing to preach about the gospel of Jesus and establish a standard of living. It's an entire other thing to do that and act as if you're not sinful and broken as well. Do you see the difference? One person says, this is what we should do, and I'm broken, and I'm trying to get there. A hypocrite says, this is what we should do, and everybody's got it wrong, and I've got it right. And they're pretending as if it's not true. You see, there were hypocrites in Jesus' day. 
Jesus told this to the hypocrites in Matthew chapter 15. He says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Matthew chapter 23 is probably one of the harshest passages of scripture that we find in the Bible. And it is against the religious people who profess one thing and did something exactly the opposite. Jesus said this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and are unclean. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness." You see, Jesus possessed something that we don't possess. He was able to look at a person, and he was able to understand their thoughts and their motives and their intentions. And unfortunately for the hypocrites, their hypocrisy was revealed in their actions. And sometimes you can tell that about a person too. That they'll profess and say one thing, but yet they actually do another. You see, one of the, one of the aspects of a hypocrite is this. They hide their inner moral sin with an external front of holiness. They appear as if they're righteous. They appear as if they have it all together. They appear holy, but in reality, Jesus says, you look like a nice whitewashed tomb, but on the inside, you're full of rotten men's bones. Think about that imagery. Think about how that comes across to his audience. That here, yeah, you look great. Nice jeans, good shirt, nice shoes. But on the inside, you're full of judgmentalism, hypocrisy, anger, sexual immorality, mean-spiritedness and so yeah you put a good face on and you come to church and you act like everything's okay but deep on the inside you're not who you proclaim to be another characteristic of hypocrisy is when a person hides their own sins by pointing out the sins of others and look we're in the church okay jesus points out my sin all the time in marriage angel and i we point out each other's sins Maybe not all of the time, but, you know, maybe once or twice a day, something like that. But no, seriously, you go through life and things bother you, right? I mean, you can't even leave the church in 10 minutes driving down the road without somebody getting underneath your skin. And you want to point out how they're such a moron and you're such a perfect driver, right? We never, Angel always tells me that. You never even think about all the mistakes you make when you drive. And I'm like, hey, I am a professional here, okay? (laughs) That's, That's my response. But think about it like this. It wasn't just last week. So Angel wanted me to go get her oil changed. And she has a screw in her tire, which needs to be fixed. And so, you know, I'm the guy, I'm the husband. And so I take to get her, you know, to her car to get it changed. And I get the oil changed, and I get the car. And sure enough, Angel's really good about following up. And uh, <clears throat> sometimes I struggle following through, but we won't get into that. And so she says, okay, honey, did you get my car done? I'm like, yeah, I got the oil changed. She says, what about the tire? And I'm like, oh. How do I get this across without lying? Okay. So that's, that's literally what's going through my mind. So I'm like, look, honey, it just slipped my mind. And she goes, yeah, just like everything else. <laughs> if you knew what my wife had to put up with, you'd be like, amen, Angel, okay? But no, it seriously did. It slipped my mind, and I meant to get it fixed, but I didn't. And instead of just saying, hey, look, I, you know, I made a mistake, you're right. I say, yeah, but who's the one taking your car to get it fixed? (laughs) Looking back, I'm laughing now, okay, because I'm like such a child. But I wanted to try to sit there and point out her inability and what she doesn't do so I can make up for my mistakes. And that's what we do in the church. People do this in their jobs all the time. I mean, when you get corrected by your boss, what's the first thing that you do? I mean, come on, let's be honest. You say, but look at all my coworkers and how much better I am than they are. Right? Or even worse, if you've got a lazy or incompetent boss, isn't that the worst? Having them point out where you make a mistake and you fall short and you're like, yeah, but you're such a terrible person. How could you point out these mistakes of mine? And think about that, but then apply that to the church. I mean, you know how awful it is to have somebody come up to you who have made a thousand mistakes in their past and they approach you as if they're perfect? I mean, it's one thing to walk up to a person and say, hey, look, I make mistakes all the time. All right, I am broken and sinful, and I am saved by grace. But I need to share with you something in my heart that I've been hurt by. Or, hey, you know, I don't think that you're doing this quite right. You know, when we read the Bible, the Bible talks about being clothed with tenderness and compassion and grace and mercy. And I feel like the way that you treat people is really harsh and brash and mean-spirited. And I don't think you're reflecting what the Bible teaches. That's one thing. 
It's entirely different to point out the sins of other people and the attempt to hide your own sin. To not be willing to be humble and share where you've made mistakes in a conversation, I think is at the very core of hypocrisy. And so we do this in marriage. We do this at our jobs. We do this in the church. And we need to fight against that. We need to reject and run from hypocrisy. You know, Jesus talked about this in Matthew chapter 7. And we're not going to go into that. But it's like the famous passage of scripture that's quoted by people. You know, judge not lest you be judged. Well, actually, the context of that passage isn't to judge not, but it's to judge without hypocrisy. Jesus says, look, you're trying to remove the speck from your brother's eye, and you've got this huge plank that's, that's bulging from your eyeball. First, remove that, and then you'll be able to see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. And so Jesus wants us to love one another and speak truth to each other, but he wants us to do that in such a way that doesn't come across hypocritical. If we really want to help people in their struggle against sin, we must start with humility. We must point to the fact that we are an open book, we are broken, we are sinful, and we are honestly trying to help this church body grow to what we know God can make it. I like how John Piper put it. John Piper preached this, hypocrisy is all about concealment and deceit and trickery and falsehood and cloaking and misleading and hiding. Hypocrisy is the opposite of rejoicing and truth. And hypocrisy is one of those things that is abhorrent to God. If you want to talk about the moments that Jesus was harsh with people, it wasn't with the person caught in adultery. It wasn't with the person infected by leprosy. It wasn't with the person who was caught in their sin and dragged before Jesus. It was with the religious people who thought that they didn't make mistakes and pointed out the mistakes of other people. That's who Jesus was harsh with back then, and that's who Jesus is harsh with today. And so as a church, we must run from hypocrisy. Now let's ask this question, the big question. Why are people hypocritical? I mean, why do we try to cover up our sin and point out the sins of other people? Why do we try to act as if we've got it all together and we don't make mistakes? Why do we do that? Well, I think the main reason is this. We want to get and keep the admiration and endorsement of the people around us. I mean, at the core of our being... That's why we post the best pictures to Facebook and Instagram. That's why we conceal and hide our sin and we're afraid to share it with the people around us. That's why we have to pretend as if we have it all together when actually we're broken and we're hurt inside. It's because we want to be accepted by the people around us. We don't want to be rejected. We want their endorsement. We want their approval. And I know that's true for you because that is true for me. Every time I look at my moment of, of hypocrisy, it's because I don't want to admit that I'm wrong, and I want to be accepted and admired in the eyes of the people around me. That's at the core of our hypocrisy. That's why we do what we do. Jesus put it like this in Matthew 6. He says, so when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Motivation. That's what we're talking about. Look. We give to the poor. There's nothing wrong with sharing about what you do uh, for the Lord in the sense of what God is doing through you. That's not wrong. What's wrong is motivation. Why are you doing what you do? Look, I want people to give to the poor. And if I think that if as a church and we celebrate what we do uh, in the kingdom of God and that gives God honor and glory and put the spotlight on him, if that encourages other people to give to the poor, that's a good thing. But if our motivation is because we want more money, or we want more people, or we want to be recognized in our social community as the best church, that is a hypocritical motivation. And so Jesus is very clearly pointing out motivation here, not action. He goes on to say this. He says, truly I say unto you, but that they have the reward in full. But when you pray... You are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Admiration, endorsement, truly I say unto you, they have the reward in full. Hypocrites say, look at what I'm doing. Authenticity says, look at what God is doing through me. Or look at what God is doing here. That's what it means to be an authentic church. And so authentic Christianity is not motivated by the praise that comes from man. The Apostle Paul says this in Galatians 1.10. He says this, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. 
One of the dangers of hypocrisy is that we can reject God's admiration for us and we can invalidate our role as his servants. That's the danger of hypocrisy. That we no longer care about the admiration of God, we care about the admiration of men. And we no longer seek to fulfill our role in serving God, but instead serving the people around us. But there's another motivation for hypocrisy. And so it's not just a characteristic of covering up people's sins, that's what they do. But it's a motivation, it's why they do what they do. Hypocrites point out the sins of other people so that they can cover up their own sin. Jesus healed a woman in Luke chapter 13. If you get time, read it this week. This woman for 18 years had a disease that caused her to be bent completely over. All the way down, she was physically incapable of standing up straight. Can you imagine what that would be like? I mean, it hurts my legs and my back sitting down in a chair and studying for six or seven hours. I can't imagine for 18 years having my back so crooked that I could not stand up straight. And Jesus goes, it's on the Sabbath day, right? Our Sabbath day is Sunday, but for the Jews it was Saturday. And he goes near the synagogue, in the synagogue, and he heals this woman. He heals her. And you have this religious leader that stands up. He's a ruler of the synagogue. And this is what he says. There are six days in which work should be done, so come during them and get healed, not on the Sabbath day. I mean, can you imagine? That would be like us stopping service, for instance, okay? We'll just take a break from service. Someone is coming up, someone has come up here in the front, and they are healed of some bodily ailment that they have, some disease or some deformity. Can you imagine if I were to look at that person and say, you know what, you need to get out of here. If you want to be healed, come do that when we're not doing church. <laughs> I mean, fire me, please, if I ever get to that point, okay? I mean, that's what this is like. These guys are horrible. This is how Jesus responds. He says, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? He looks at this guy, and he says, here is this broken woman coming to church to be healed, and you are so concerned about what you believe the law teaches And you are so concerned about being in control. And you are so concerned about your own money that you would rather point out what you believe to be is wrong, which it's not, to protect and cover up your own sin, which is greed and lust for power and lust for money. You hypocrite. That man left there that day, it says, ashamed, humiliated before Jesus because Jesus called it out like it was. And my hope and prayer this morning as we talk about what it means to be an authentic church is for you to think about your own self. Are there areas in your life where you seem hypocritical? Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's as a family, parents and kids. Maybe it's as a sibling. I don't know what it is. But are there areas in your life where you come across as hypocritical, giving double double standards? Have you received grace from God and you're not willing to extend that grace to the people around you? Have you received mercy and forgiveness and kindness, and yet you want judgment and wrath and accountability for the people around you? Are you a hypocrite in some way, shape, or form of your life? Jesus looked at this Pharisee, and he saw that he was enthusiastic for his religion, but it was hypocritical. It fell short because he secretly only carried about his money and his control. You see, he placed institutional values over human values. It's like placing certain laws in the church or in America over human values. Look, I'm a Christian first. I follow Jesus first before I'm an American citizen. I am a husband before I am a father. I am a father before I am a brother. My loyalty belongs to Jesus and Jesus Christ alone first. And so when we come to situations in our life or circumstances in our country or circumstances in our family and we have a crossroads, what's the right thing to do? Christian values come first. That is our foundation of who we need to be as a follower of Jesus. And yet this man was more concerned about institution rather than human. He was more concerned about property rather than God's property. And both ethically and theologically, the need of this daughter took precedence over the Sabbath laws. Jesus also put it like this in another place. He says, so you say you can't work on the Sabbath. If you walked by a man and you saw his donkey laying in a ditch, And his whole livelihood was going to die. Are you telling me that you would honestly follow that law rather than help this man out? He says, you've got it twisted. You were not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for you to give you rest. And a lot of people think that the Sabbath was more about 
uh, things that you shouldn't do. That's not it at all. The Sabbath was about things that you should do. And that's what Christianity is. It's not about a list of things that you shouldn't do. It's a gigantic list of things that you should do. Things that you should pursue and you should do. That's how we need to approach what it means to be a follower of God. Not about what we shouldn't do, but what about we should do. Jesus told the Pharisees this. Woe to you, teachers of the law, and you Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you give a tenth of your spices, your mint, your dill, your cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. And if as a church we ever reach the point where we care more about laws and rules and regulations than people, justice, mercy, and faithfulness, we've missed the point. And so if we lose our sense of Christian values with respect to people, we become hypocrites. And the problem isn't our sin. The problem is how we live in light of our sin. The problem isn't uh, whether or not we make mistakes, but how we live in light of those mistakes. And so we must run away from hypocrisy. We need to be authentic Christians. Well, what is authenticity? What, is it, what does it mean to be authentic? I, I watched a movie. It's kind of a bad movie. But I watched a movie about, you know, robbery. And uh, these guys were bank robbers. And so they were in Boston. And what they would do is they would travel around to different banks. I think it was based on a true story. I can't remember. But anyway, so they eventually got caught. But the police didn't know if it was really them. And so police do what police do. They brought them in to be questioned and evaluated. And there were certain phrases that they said during the robbery that they wanted them to repeat during their evaluation of these four criminals. And so they took their pictures and their fingerprints, and then here's what they wanted them to do. They wanted them to read off the phrases that the witnesses heard in the bank. And here's what they were hoping. When the criminals read off the phrases, right, the witnesses would be able to say, yeah, that's the voice that I heard, and yeah, that's exactly how he said it. Well, look, criminals aren't complete morons, okay? Some, of the, some criminals are like actually like really, really smart. It's amazing. They like develop their own languages and all kinds of stuff just to escape the law. And so they're having one of the guys read off the script, right? And he is totally butchering it. Kind of, I would probably do the same thing, right? I'm not going to read it authentically. I'm going to read it like a, like a mask, like I'm faking it. And so he's reading it, he's butchering it, and the cop looks at this, this guy and he goes, don't they teach you how to read? I mean, what are you doing? And this is how I get into my, box, my Boston accent. Are you guys ready? Letting you on a little quarter. You say quarter. And when you talk like that, it puts you in a Boston accent. Isn't that awful? I felt like such a loser practicing that this week. So I'm just going to tell you it like I'm not going to do my Boston accent because it makes me feel weird. But anyway, so he looks at him and he goes, what do you mean? I'm trying to make this sound authenticious. <laughs> I'm like, this guy is such a moron. He doesn't even know the word authenticity. And I think he messed it up on purpose. But if we don't know what it means to be an authentic person, we'll never be able to run away from hypocrisy. And so we want to be authentic, not authenticious, okay? And we want to be us. We want to be the real church, not what we think we should be or what the world has said that we should be. And so authenticity, we read this verse last week. Romans chapter 12, verse 9, let love be sincere. We've got other words maybe in our translation, genuine, sincere, the Greek word can actually be translated, and it often is in the text, without hypocrisy. In other words, we look at hypocrisy and we say, I don't want to be that. That's not what I want to be. I want to be something different. I want to be genuine. I want to be sincere. I want to be an authentic person. Love, at the end of the day, has supreme importance in the church. That doesn't mean justice doesn't have importance. But at the end of the day, love has supreme importance in the church. Jesus singled it out as the essence of God's law. They went to Jesus. They said, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. The Bible talks about how when Jesus sent out his disciples in John chapter 13, he says, the world is going to know you by how you love each other. And so if we are going to start being a genuine church, it starts with the people that you're sitting next to. It starts right here in this auditorium. We're going to get a chance to go eat after this. Everyone is invited to a free lunch. It's going to be great. And we just want to genuinely love each other. I mean, that's why we're here as a church. Hang out, get to know each other, love each other, eat together, spend time with each other. Love, at the end of the day, is who we're called to be. The Greek word love is agape. The Greeks had three main different words for love. Eros erotic love. It's never used in the New Testament, but that's passion love, a love between a husband and a wife. And then you had phileo love. It's where we get the word Philadelphia. 
city of brotherly love. And so it means to bring people in close, to hug them, to share intimate moments. That's what we're called to do as a church. And then you've got this word agape. It means self-sacrificial, self-denial. When Jesus says love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, he didn't say phileo them. Don't walk up and give them a hug. But if they are in need, if they're hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. Agape them. Sacrifice for them. That's what we are called to do. And so at the end of the day, if our love is going to be genuine, it's got to be selfless. It's got to be sacrificial. It's the kind of love that Jesus displayed on the cross for us when he gave himself up to be beaten and crucified as a payment for our sins. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 says this, This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. What kind of love must we profess? Sincere, authentic, genuine love. Not hypocritical. It means to remove the mask, to get rid of the counterfeit, without pretense, without shame. Be the person that God has called you to be. And so we look at the beginning of this message, and we point to that, and we say, I'm not going to be that. I'm not going to be hypocritical. Peter uses this word in 1 Peter 1.22. He says, since you have obedience to the truth, and you have purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another. Where? From the heart. That's what it means to be genuine and sincere, is it comes from the heart. You're not going through the emotions, but you're doing it. Because you do love that person. Love, remember, is an action, not a feeling. An action of self-sacrifice. Not a warm, fuzzy, emotional thing that you get when you see somebody that you love. That's the difference. And so an authentic church is a church that doesn't hide behind false motives. It's like, for instance, why did we do VBS this year? Vacation Bible School for the Kids. We did that because we love our children. We did that because we love our community and we want to provide a safe, Christ-like environment for people to come and worship God. I talked to a father this week and it was VBS, watching his daughter love and praise and fall in love with Jesus that he said, you know what, I want to become a member of this church. I have had a crisis of faith for the last several years, but when I saw how my daughter responded to VBS and that experience, man, I just, I want to serve and I want to be a follower of Jesus again. I mean, it was awesome. That's why we do what we do. Why do we raise funds for leukemia? We were able to, for those of you who don't know, we were able to hand over a thousand dollar check um, for this specific disease for John Hopkins Research Center called All. It's a specific form of leukemia. We did that because we believe that disease is an effect of the curse and that as Christians, we hate death. We hate disease. We hate hurt and pain and we want to do everything we can to fight against that. We want to raise money for our children's rooms because we love our children. Not because we just want a better facility, but because we want them to kick and drag and scream if you parents decide you're not going to come to church. No, mom and dad, I've got to go to church. I love church. That's what we want. Why do we do winter relief? Why do we take care of homeless people here for a week? Does it get the glory of men? I guarantee not a single person in this room, maybe a few of you who are actually really ultimately involved at the high level, could name off five people that get involved in winter relief. And that's, a, that's not a bad thing. Because we're not doing it for the glory of man. We're doing it for the glory of God. Paul said in Galatians 2.10, remember the poor. Remember the poor. God is in charge. We want to give God the glory. We support the pregnancy clinic. We cook meals for officers. We host fall fest and Christmas Eve services. I mean, we do what we do here because we love God and we love each other. That is at the core of an authentic church. Jesus told his disciples in John 13, the world will know you by how you love me and how you love each other. And so an authentic church will be known for their selflessness, what they sacrifice, and their self-forgetful service to Christ. When people look at us, they don't see us. They see God and his glory. That's who we want to put the spotlight on. That's what it means to be an authentic church. And so there are three things that I want to leave you with this morning about how you can forget yourself because it's not easy. The first thing that you can do to forget yourself is, as we've already talked about, have a heart that truly loves. Be authentic and genuine in your love. 1 Timothy 1.15 says, The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. And so an authentic church will have genuine love and a faith that works. 
We will have a faith that works. Notice what James says in James chapter 2, verses 15 and 17. He says, if a brother or sister is without clothing, clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm, and be filled, and yet do not give to them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. And so if all we are is a church that sits down and listens to sermons and studies the Bible, and we don't get out and meet the needs of the people and our church family, we have a faith that doesn't work. We have a faith that is dead. And so we need to love selflessly, sacrificially, forgetfully. We need to be an authentic church with an authentic, authentic faith that works. And finally, we need to have an authentic wisdom. Here's a question for you. How have your decisions in life worked out for you thus far? When you look at the major moments in your life when you've experienced pain and hurt, have they often come from your personal decisions, not from external circumstances that have been forced on you, but haven't the majority of your painful situations and experiences come from really bad decisions that you've made, right? I mean, I can point to every time where I've experienced pain from a decision because I did something that was stupid. Bottom line. The wisdom of God is genuine. It's without hypocrisy. It's able to see things clearly. Godly wisdom has the capability to remove the worldly distractions and see things as they are. Here's what James said in James 3.17. The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. And I want you to take a look at that verse. And I want you to see those different descriptions about what it means to have genuine wisdom. And I want you to ask yourself, do my decisions in my marriage, as a parent, as a student, as an athlete, as an employee, reflect the things that I see in this scripture? Do my decisions result in peace and love? Am I being considerate in my decisions? Am I being submissive? Am I yielding and giving way? Am I full of mercy or am I full of wrath? Am I producing good fruit? Is my judgment impartial? Or am I only always listening to one side of the story and never hearing the other side? Do I exercise genuine, godly wisdom? An authentic church will be a church that loves from the heart, a faith that works, an authentic wisdom that wins. You know, if I ask ourselves this question, what is our reputation in the community? If you've never been here before, don't answer out loud. Might be afraid what I hear. But uh, if I ask you that question, what's our reputation in the community? Most of you might say, never really heard of this church before. Or don't really know. I mean, it's where my, where my family goes. Or maybe, maybe if you ask somebody, ask somebody this week. Say, hey, what, do you know about Seven Christian Church? What's their reputation? Oh, is that the church that's across from Papa John's Farm? No, that's not us. We're a little bit farther down the road. We're set a little bit back in. We're farmland. We have a big red roof. Oh, it's the church with the big red roof. That's the one, right? What is our church known for? I want our church, our elders, our other staff, our leaders here, and I know our members, we want our church to serve in such a way that if we no longer existed, our community would know it. That's what we're aiming for. That's what we want to be, a church that's authentic in our love and our faith and what we do and the decisions that we make. That's what we should strive for, and that's what I want to encourage you this morning that you should personally strive for as a Christian. And if we're all doing our part, the church will be what it's called to be. Mm -hmm.